Ah, to start, let's I take this one excerpt from a research article in reference to breakthrough infections published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And of course, you know, being 12.40 a.m., it's the ideal time to uh, peruse through uh, research articles. And there's one line that particularly stood out. Now, I'm going to read it. I'm not going to incorporate any publisher bias except basically elucidating the one topic sentence of the paragraph just for food for thought. And here we begin. The healthcare workers at our institution had only mild symptoms, but high viral loads. Threshold of under 25 and prolonged, let's highlight that there, prolonged viral shedding of up to 32 days after diagnosis. I'm going to reiterate through the line once again so it sinks in. The healthcare workers at our institution had only mild symptoms but high viral loads, cycle thresholds of under 25, and prolonged viral shedding up to 32 days after diagnosis. These are fully vaccinated individuals. And just to be fair, this was a very small sampling of breakthrough cases, but this is how signals first get discovered and then expanded upon potentially later on. Here are PCR days uh, before they actually had a negative test result after the first, uh, how would you describe it, symptoms uh, basically arose. But that's what we're looking at. The healthcare workers at our institution had only mild symptoms, but high viral loads. And prolonged viral shedding of up to 32 days after diagnosis. That is a pretty major twist. Now also keep in mind, we're not talking immunocompromised individuals, which immunocompromised individuals can end up doing this for quite some time too. But however, though, we are talking health care workers. All right, with that in mind, again, good morning to our data analysts, data scientists, epidemiologists, bioinformatics, and all of our data-oriented audience as well. For those that like data, and here we begin, we'll be covering this article here, which we actually already did. British Medical Journal, fully vaccinated people can carry as much Delta virus as unvaccinated people. Existing drug, and we know not to use this word because it will get us censored, mitigates SARS-CoV-2 in cells, an incredibly enlightening article in reference to lactoferrin. Yes, lactoferrin derived from cow's milk. And to proceed forward, uh, study supports widespread use of better masks to curb COVID-19 indoors. Now, the title is deceiving. So the papers picked it up and they, re they incorporated publisher bias and incorporated their own ideas. And they say blue surgical face masks are only 10% effective in preventing COVID infection. That's kind of what the research article said. Uh, but however, though, as we get into the article, what the author is really implying is that the masks which are being currently used in mass are basically superfluous. Now, they recommend N95 masks. Now, however, though, again, even that has a 50% efficacy, but let's cover that when we get to that story. All right, here we go. Combine efforts of masking. I want to show you this because this was the Mayo Clinic and it plays into this article here and also the article we discovered before from MIT in reference to uh, masking in indoor rooms, their effectiveness. Uh, but this is actually kind of cool. When we watch the video, we'll go to that in a second. All right, patients with history of COVID-19 had more side effects after first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. To reiterate the title, patients that had pr infected prior of COVID-19, or they say history of COVID-19, had more side effects after the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine, as opposed, which we obviously should be covering all the way down here, as opposed individuals had been vaccinated, which had never been exposed to the virus at all. So we'll go into the likelihood of those individuals that had already had COVID-19 getting vaccinated having a reaction. No spread from SARS-CoV-2 from infected, Key word here is symptomatic children. We're not talking asymptomatic. We're talking children, 
that on those rare or uncommon occasions shows symptoms of SARS-CoV-2 infection that are symptomatic. And this was the outcome. We'll look at that in a second, a little more in detail. A uh, combination of anti natural antivirals and potent immune invigorators. Again, another word, tagline that will get you censored uh, in this wonderful world, dystopian world of protecting people from information and words in order to help them stay smarter. All right, but proceed forward. <laughs> we covered this over the over the weekend, and we'll, I'll, I'll allude to the video as well, but this is an important article, and it plays really, really, really well with this one here too. Uh, whatever we can do to help keep people healthy, the tools and information have been researched very heavily out there, and it's now looking for confirmation and getting grease in the wheels, so to say. Short-term reactions among pregnant lactated women. This article was used to promote the COVID vaccines among pregnant and lactating individuals. Yeah, all right. So basically, those individuals who are pregnant and lactating, it was used to promote, uh, that's just a very politically correct uh, way of putting it. If you read the title a couple of times, it'll sink in. Uh, but basically, it it basically, we look at the data, you you can make your own, uh, basically, basically, I'm parsing my words, conclusion in reference to the effectiveness of these vaccines. Now, keep in mind, too, that this was only done, uh, the reactions were only followed for one day, one day. And yet there was still some concerns, but, and it was done by survey. But I want to look at the survey group as well. Uh, next, that's the video I did, which should come closer to the uh, one in reference to the uh, actual antivirals and potent immune invigorators. Uh, and our data sources, our world and data, the vaccine adverse reporting system, VAERS from the CDC. This is the disclaimer. All the reports that we're going to be covered are only reports submitted to VAERS. And VAERS has to validate whether those, uh, those uh, reports actually have weight, are pertinent, or there could be other confounding factors. But the problem with VAERS, which they need to fix real soon, is all because VAERS does not validate it, you know, they can't just sit and never validate the information. If they never validated the information, then all the reports obviously can never be confirmed. And if they never confirm the information, VAERS, then those claims of those effects can't be made because it's up to VAERS to claim it. You understand the circular reasoning? So if VAERS doesn't do the research because they're overwhelmed by the massive number of reports that are coming in, then then that claim of any potential side effect that may actually exist as a signal can never be made. So it, it's a catch-22 situation. So we're very dependent upon VAERS either confirming or denying the relationship. And if they'd never say anything about it, nothing from anybody else could ever be said at the same time. See the problem? All right. And that sounded very wordy, but that's the way it is. All right. And then basically we went to the GIS aid as well. Let me close this out there. And we're looking at the European database and the European database as far as their reactions in regard to the COVID vaccines, which you may notice have uh, slightly different words you may see right there. For example, you see Pfizer's otherwise called as Tazenamaran and you know, AstraZeneca, Janssen, Janssen, Moderna, so on and so forth. And uh, they have quite a, a diverse base. And also, too, our data as follows. We'll be looking at, da, da, da. let's move that aside there. That's the loom. Uh, we'll be looking at the, the basically the COVID effects in the United States. We are between states. We'll be looking at Florida, California, Texas, and New York. Uh, we'll be looking at the mutation data. We'll probably start off with that. Um, also, too, just a side note to begin, this is the positivity rate in Sweden. And if we look also a little further here, let's look at positivity rate in India. And what does that play a role? Just to give you a little bit of a taste. Vaccination, fully vaccinated, positivity rate. 
How's that compare to the United States? We'll want to find out in a second. All right, and then also too, be going to various database. Various database just to clear up the information real fast. A lot of people like to keep track. I usually try to keep it on the uh, report the title as well. Total reports submitted to VAERS as of the 13th of August, they did update their, uh, their, their, their thing there, is 460,861. Watch the wording. These are reports submitted to VAERS. So you cannot say they are vaccine side effect reports. The, I'm trying to help others out there, uh, especially a lot of people which are politically um, engaged. The wording is vital. These are reports submitted to VAERS. Also, too, for other data analysts, I cannot reiterate. They should appreciate that word enough to reiterate that, for example, many reports are duplicated. For example, you have a VARES ID here. You can read the exact same ID. The reason being is because some individuals have so many symptoms. And all you can do is fit five symptoms on one report that they'll often, they will often file, like for example here, uh, multiple reports. And henceforth, that will cause uh, misguided information in reference to mortality, which even the CDC got caught. Remember the CDC had to readjust their figures down to figures which we had uh, because they were duplicating the reports. They were not counting the whys under the mortality. They were, so I'm just trying to say, the CDC makes mistakes too. And just corrected it two weeks ago, but we've been right on cue the entire time. All right, and so we'll review that in a second. And also briefly review the, um, what they're experiencing in Europe. And again, these are reports to the Euro Enduro Vigilance. Uh, it was Enduro Vigilance. Yeah, Euro Vigilance, uh, European database. And so they're being hit pretty hard too with a massive number of reports being submitted to them. And, you know, my problem is not with basically the reports being submitted in the data is do they have the teams available to investigate this unprecedented number of reports being submitted to these um, agencies beyond anything we've ever seen before? All right, and let us proceed as follows. You ready? Let's go right into the stories. Let's do, 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 do. Here we go. All right, breakthrough infections for fully vaccinated healthcare workers. Nice story in New England Medical Journal. Again, we covered most of it right from the very beginning. This is a signal. Uh, this is an issue when you can have fully vaccinated individuals have high viral loads. Now, the caveat here, their symptoms were not severe. They only had mild symptoms. But normally you expect with mild symptoms, you would have lower viral loads. But no, the viral loads were high. So here you have a combination of high viral loads and you have prolonged viral shedding. So now that is really an interesting combination. Now, however, though, without having the context, the context being, you know, we want to see if this is the same effect with the Delta variant in unvaccinated individuals. All right, since most of our information has to deal with the variant, I think D614G, that doesn't even exist anymore, except some remote areas of Africa. So, if we have the proper context, we can make the determination of whether this is an issue or not. Again, you I mean you hear me utilize the word parse my words very carefully because there's too many unknowns. We don't have context. All we know is certain individuals had, that were not immunocompromised had high viral loads, had mild symptoms, and shed up to 32 days after diagnosis interesting and I'm sure as time moves forward uh, we will uh, expand or exp expand expound upon this information now next one we go here 
Do do do. Next one we go here. That's 12:58 a.m. speech. All right, here we go. COVID-19 fully vaccinated people can carry as much Delta virus as un as unvaccinated people. Data indicate. Wonderful. All right, most of the article is basically uh, uh, saying you know how wonderful vaccines are, so on and so forth. You know, the um, the typical disclaimers put upon every single article that says anything negative about a vaccine. And often, usually what they have, and then without me in, incorporating meaning into the article, which the authors may not have intended to exist. Um, yeah, it's what I consider circumlocutions. You hear me use that word a little often. During the Dark Ages, scientists can never speak directly. So they spoke in code. And often, for example, when you hear see massive disclaimers put at the front saying, oh, the history of vaccines is this and this and this and this. And then as you start reading through the article, it makes you wonder why they spend so much time on the first part of the subject, you know, basically expounding upon the word again, the wonders of vaccinations, if it had very little to do with that to begin with. Well, that's the common wording. If I'm wording sounds circular well that's most of the articles in reference to anything that may question uh some element of a vaccine so COVID 19 fully vaccinated people can carry as much delta virus as unvaccinated people that indicate go to the bottom here quote we know that the vaccination will not stop infection and transmission all right if we were keeping score on how many times uh the consensus at the moment that something new or beneficial reference to a vaccine came out was wrong. I would love to see some sort of, um, how I would describe it, um, natural language processing as far as basically in a very Boolean sense to look at predictions or statements like once you're vaccinated, you can't get sick and stuff like that. And how many times they were just completely, completely wrong. And so, you know, now we know as time moves forward with the best information available, vaccinations will not stop infection and transmission, but reduce the risk. The main value of immunization is reducing the risk of severe disease and death, albeit. And again, now this is an absolute term. And reducing the risk, it appears to be fairly, uh, you know, it seems, appears to be at this point in time, uh, they have data to support that issue. But they also had claimed, too, that they had data to say this would not occur. And now we have a leaky vaccine. And I'm not going to uh, get into why leaky vaccines can be problematic in the future. But if you take this information and you combine it with this information, all right, and that's all I'm going to allude to. Existing drug blah, 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 SARS-CoV-2 in cells. And again, I regret this censorship these days and you can't say words. And number one, you don't really, you would never, nothing really kills something that's not alive. But I think we have to redefine what life is, obviously. But, you know, you'll end up splitting hairs in reference to RNA and stuff like that. But here we go. The cells are treated with more than 1,000. This is, this, is, this is the discovery. This is actually really cool. And the cells are treated with more than 1,400 individual FDA-approved drugs and compounds, either before or after viral infection and screen, resulting in 17 potential hits. Ten of those hits were newly recognized with seven identified in previous drug repurposing studies, including remdesivir, which is one of the few FDA-approved therapies for COVID-19 in the hospital patients. The team validated the 17 candidate compounds in several types of cells, including stem cell-derived human lung cells in effort to mimic SARS-CoV-2 infection of the respiratory tract. Nine showed antiviral activity at reasonable doses, including lactoferrin, a protein found in human breast milk that is also available over-the-counter as a dietary supplement derived from cow's milk. We found Lactoferrin had remarkable efficacy for preventing infection, working better than anything else we observed. I am going to reiterate that. We found lactoferrin had remarkable efficacy for preventing infection, working better than anything else we observed. What did they observe? 
They went through 1,400 individual FDA-approved drugs and compounds, resulting in 17 potential hits. And of that, lactoferrin reigned supreme. And how difficult is it to go to hold of lactoferrin without making any you know, claims of use or benefit in reference to the pandemic of the day? Yeah, that's exactly it. All right, and just to give you an idea, I did not have the study up. Let's go to the study real fast. I'll have the links, of course, as well, too. And hopefully this pops up pretty fast because it, it, this is really, really, really amazing. And if I say really a lot because it really, really, really is. And if you look at the data here and you see like lactoferrin, with, you look at everything they looked at and you go, boom, you know, lactoferrin. And it just like goes, wow. And so that's just to give you an idea of how impactful it is. There's a little X there. And you can go here, I think, too. Is that lactoferrin? Yeah, lactoferrin, bovine lactoferrin, ba-boom. And you go like human lactoferrin. And so it's like really an incredibly, incredible detailed research article. Now keep in mind, it has to be tested in living subjects. And of course, two would be nice if it's tested in people. So again, this is week, this is week number 45. We've been covering all the research and technology in reference to the pandemic of the day, waiting for it to go away. But beside that, that is amazing. And these, are deep, these aren't just some person who's coming out and saying, ah, you know, my grandmother took this and felt better. No, this is not chicken soup correlations. This is actually pretty solid work. Uh, you read the highlights here. And as far as that, this should be, this should uh, render it to 4K. So hopefully you could read that. Uh, and then listen, it goes on and on and on. And it's an incredibly, incredible, sightful thing. And if the research is validated in other studies as well, uh, wow, that'd be the simplest and easiest way to fix this entire problem. Lock the ferrin. And, you know, something without, the toxicity or side of toxicity of everything else that's out there. And it's there. And again, too, for individuals which are hesitant in reference to vaccines, again, keep in mind those people which are pro-vaccine and things along those lines, it, it's being, it's being, being pro a class of medicine or negative a class of medicine, you have to understand the mentality is no one's anti-treatment. They may be anti a certain treatment or I shouldn't say even anti because that assumes some sort of polarity. Uh, they question something. And if you're looking at the best interests of individuals, uh, shouldn't you have more than just one potential way of treating a situation? So we put all of our eggs in one basket. We threw everything into vaccines and masks, and that's it. But after 45 weeks of doing this, and those of which have been with me from the beginning, how many different positive potential treatments have we covered every single week and how many have actually been researched, uh, per se? Not a lot, but you get the you get the gist. So give people options. And if the vaccine is not up to par, then maybe the better route would have been to have more than all your eggs in one basket. But to proceed as follows. And so here we go. Do do do. Study supports widespread use of better masks to curb uh, COVID nineteen indoors. All right. This is what it said. This is how you be careful on how you read articles. 10% effective in preventing COVID infection. All right. That's so, but you see, people are going to read that and they go, well, if the surgical masks are 10% effective, that's better than not effective at all. That's not what the article really said. So you have to be really careful how your own biases could in, it reinterpret something. And we're going to go into biases in a second, too. But let's, let's read what the article actually said. Blue surgical face masks are only 10% effective in preventing COVID infection. That's the news story. Article said, the study showed the most common masks primarily due to problems with fit filter about 10% of exhaled, 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 exhausted, ex exhaled aerosol droplets. 10% of exhaled aerosol droplets. The remaining aerosols are redirected mostly out of the top of the mask where it fits over the nose and escape into the ambient air unfiltered. See, let's revisit that article. It didn't say that, did it? It said 10% of exhaled, exhaled, 
exhaled aerosol droplets. That's what it said. And so does that mean that that 10% can result in 100% infection or not? That's the point. You don't know. Or maybe 10% is too low to have uh, enough particular to get infected at all. But you have to be careful on how you read the article. And to proceed, this is another aspect from it. Even modest ventilation rates were found to be as effective as the best masks in reducing the risk of transmission. So that means the N95. And N95s, you, I don't think you have a lot of kids running around with N95s. But a lot of the healthcare professionals, which I'm friends with, usually they have to take classes on how to fit these properly. And if they're not fitting properly, then you go back to this again here. And I think the Koreans, when they originally did the study long, uh, in the beginning of the pandemic, were looking at N95s, and they just threw their hands up in the air because they said only 14% of the population at that time was wearing N95s appropriately. So, you know, and think about schools. You talk about schools and saying, oh, kids in masks and things like that. But, and again, I don't know, but how many schools have actually had classes on the proper fitting and wear of masks? If you're going to play the game, then then actually try to make it look good. So I don't know if kids even know how to wear masks properly, what a proper fit may be. Do they cover that in school? I'd be really curious to know. If they don't, well, then that's, that's pretty bad, wouldn't you think? But just the same here. Uh, the mask issue, especially indoors, uh, I don't know where they came up with the data saying mask work indoors. Uh, and then I'm not, I don't question it. It's not for me to choose selection bias. Say I'm choose, I'm checking research to basically, you know, provide confirmation bias per se. So I'm only picking and choosing what I can feel to create my viewpoint. It's the fact is just like the American Academy of Sciences and everything else that, uh, not the American, the, AA, the, the other one is basically that I haven't seen the data in a real world setting to validate it. The only few studies that were done to validate the use of masks uh, effectively was the damn mask study. And what did they do? They spent more time trying to disarm that study than actually validate it. Uh, and also, too, there was another uh, mask one on CO2, CO2 in children, and they shot it down. But there's other studies, which we'll cover towards the end, if I can find them, in reference to CO2 buildup in mask use, uh, use going way above the EPA recommended standards within a short period of time. So there, so the thing about it is, is there are, it's not selection bias in choosing arguments to discredit masks. It's seeing valid arguments to support mask use. So again, you have to look at it from that aspect, but to proceed as follows. Do, do, do. Ah, here it is. This is the Mayo Clinic one. The Mayo Clinic one, this is a real interesting aspect because the Mayo Clinic one article right here, and I like the Mayo Clinic a lot, uh, was actually basically utilizing information to support mask use. And here is the video. It's interesting how visual uh, people can see things. Um, for example, we found that both disposable paper and medical two-layer masks were effective in reducing droplet transmission. And we now find a difference between mask types. All right. Now, it's interesting because it's how we perceive information. And I'm not going to get into confounding and things like that. But here we have one article that says it only filtered about 10% of aerosol drops. We have another article saying it was effective. Now, I love this film we're going to look at right here because this, this is so telling. And this is all about perception. You know, like how people say oh, the yellow dress or green dress, whatever those, those color uh, gambit things you do in the media. Well, Let's play this. All right. Do you see the mask working? It's from the Mayo Clinic. We'll play a little longer. Just go through different types of masks. Now, remember what MIT. MIT came up and said, well, the air goes up and just lingers in the room and just flows someplace else. And so... It's an interesting perception because, again, this is this is the masks working in action. And, uh, oh, well, halfway done. Are you ready? Just keep on going. Let's see if they get into N95 masks. I didn't watch the whole video because, obviously, it got, gets repetitive after a period of time. So if the researcher is saying, look at our masks, they're working perfectly. 
Well, we're maskless. You see what they're comparing? They're comparing this guy whistling at somebody in their face compare it to that's really cool got it compare it to this then MIT comes around and so does this researcher the researcher here from the University of Waterloo comes out and says hey it, it doesn't make a difference the, the aerosol droplets are still escaping except for 10% and they're just sitting there in the room going all over the freaking place yeah you didn't breathe right on the guy's face but you're indoors what goes up has to come down. And the Mayo Clinic goes, well, look at the bright side. They're not spitting directly in your face. It makes no difference. But you get the point. It's an interesting way of perception. All right, proceed forward. Patients with a history of COVID-19 had more side effects after the first dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And please forgive me. It's not the jovial and rep- represent this uh, because it is just, it's like, wow. When you read this. Overall... 229 patients reported at least one side effect among participants with a history of COVID-19, 74%. Those that already had COVID-19 and they get vaccinated, now keep, keep in mind, this is just initial reports. It's not long-term reports or serious reports. 95% reported one adverse event, event versus 70% in naive patients. That's a weird way of putting it, but yeah, that, you know what the wording is. And the figure as follows not exactly clear you think it'd be a little better graphic uh but there is your your people that already been vaccinated and that's the likelihood of them having a not necessarily a severe reaction you know just having pain fever chills fatigue headache muscle pain joint pain arrhythmia so you know what it's almost like this if your employer is telling you to get vaccinated and you already been sick uh, of COVID-19, and then you come in and you get vaccinated, then they better have some sick days put aside for you, at the very least. Because even if your sick days are up, and then you they send you someplace that you have to get vaccinated so you don't get sick, but then you get sick, or not sick, I should say, sick-like symptoms from the vaccine? No, 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 no. The employer has got a, uh, has got a you know, penny up on that one. And that's a new word. I know it's, it's a play on words, but still just the same? No. That, no, 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 no. Employers, no possible. You're forcing people, uh, you're, you're stepping on people's biological sovereignty, then you're not going to take responsibility for basically any actions that occur. Uh, no, no, that, that game doesn't get played very well. Here we go. And so that's what that is. And now the links to as well, too. So you can just go, hey, you know, this is the way it is. On top of that, what's even more insult to injury is the fact is that individuals which already had COVID-19, and I'm sure you read this, and then get vaccinated, actually get a better immune response than people that have never been vaccinated at all. So it's like, no, you can't play the vaccine benefit off the people that have already been sick from COVID and then you vaccinate them on top of that. No, that's not cool either, but still just the same. To proceed, no spread of SARS-CoV-2 from infected symptomatic children. Symptomatic. Children which are showing symptoms. Quote, conclusion, none, as in zero, none, of the infected children transmitted SARS-CoV-2 infection to their caregivers. I love, I love the hypothesis and how the, the nun could have arrived at none. Raising the hypothesis of either a, a cluster of resistant mothers that just happened to have in the study. So basically they're saying, well, chance, but there's, it's either we had all the mothers which were basically immune to COVID-19. Maybe there's a chance of that happening. Let's try another study. Or a limited transmission from children to adults despite prolonged exposure and close contact. So again, I'll have the link to the study as well. We're not talking we're talking prolonged contact living, their moms and kids, and not the kids aren't transmitting it to the parents, at least in this one particular study, that are staying home. So you know, it's none. Or by some odd chance, when they conducted the study, they managed to pick up a tremendously large group of immune mothers, per se, or individuals. But to proceed as follows. All right. Combination natural antivirals. I did the video on this. Keep in mind, I'll, I'll link the video that we did uh, last week because it was pretty intense as far as all the things they had. But I did the video, but the video I did wasn't designed to cover um, 
each individual element there. But for those not familiar, let's go back down. It says natural products in general and plant constituents specifically are unique sources. Well, you know what? Let's just go right into the research as follows. Uh, here we go down. I want to show you the charts. You see how they go through the charts here? Now, this is going to be in 4K, so if it's in 360p when it first renders, it may be tough to see. But I'm trying to encourage you to go to the research because as I scroll through all of this, you notice how it tells you what it does in the sources as well. In fact, let's see if I can make this a little bigger. Yeah. All right, so as I scroll through, you can see but that's just one table. All right. As we begin to go down, wonderful, beautiful graphics. Here's another table. You read the mechanisms of actions. You see the references. All the way down the line. Again, I'm just here to link it for you. There's no possible way we can cover every single element. But you see, I mean, we can, but a bit. Good luck. Me trying to keep your attention for five hours. All right, here we go. And uh, but if people paid attention for five hours, I would do it for five hours, hands down. You kidding? Uh, again, whatever we do to help individuals or help get us past this point, it'd be wonderful. Um, as you see here, more mechanisms of action as far as what it is. Epigallic catechin gallate. Many people are familiar with green tea. Uh, many people are familiar with this from licorice. All right. Many people are familiar with this from uh, lychee berry, uh, kirsten erbicitin, aspiritin from you know from your plants like citrus. That's a good way to put in it. And da, da, da. and you go down the line. And of course, your colors, rutin, for example, part of your bioflavonoid group. Um, also good for metabolization of brown fats, quercetin, eucalyptus, and places like that. So you see all the references. Theoflavin, theoflavin, black tea. So you get, like, for example, you recognize a lot of this. And really interesting stuff. And now, it's interesting as far as here. I don't know how they get from there. They're there from 2001, but you get the point. Uh, everything they have here is really interesting and in depth. But it gives you a really, really good breakdown of what each one does and how it functions. Now, whether it works or not in reference to living individuals, uh, in reference to SARS-CoV-2, uh, that is to be elucidated in further studies. But however, though, again, when you look at the study itself, just to give you an idea, well, I covered this in the video, it was first published on August 15, 2021, but it was submitted July of 2020. So it was July 16th or 15th, I believe. And it was not published for over a year later. You'll discover that in the PDF. But it's So a lot of the information you'll read in here when you're reading it sounds speculative because it is at that time. This was before vaccinations and things like that were actually discovered. And some of the medications that were being talked about were just still being researched. But yet the information here is just still just as valid. It just hasn't been delved into any deeper or those studies have not been uh, uh, brought to our attention as of yet. But to proceed as follows. Short-term reactions among pregnant lactating individuals and first wave of COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Now, this is interesting because this research article here was used the rationale to start vaccinating uh, pregnant pregnant individuals or lactating individuals. I'm using their terminology. But let's, if we look at, for example, the figures and the tables, I want to show you something interesting. All right. This obviously, let's see if we can make this bigger. This is the frequency of symptoms. All right. Pain and ejection side would be kind of common. But you see a high level there, you know, as far as what's concerned, as far as what's available and what's not. All right, but however, though, if we go down, let's see, can we go sideways here? Now we're not giving that sideways issue. Let's go here. This is going to be quite interesting. Ready? This 
is group selection. Pregnant individuals. Now, you want to tell me if this is an outlier or not. This is for the statisticians epidemiologists. Look at the amount of individuals in this sampling that had a doctorate or professional degree. That is the most extreme outlier as far as research is concerned I've ever seen. Obviously, this is not a random sampling. So we have individuals which uh, are very much engaged in the healthcare uh, field. So most likely this could have been doctors or something along those lines. Only 281 with some college or less. And about 900, so you have, you have almost as many people uh, that have a professional doctor degree than actually they have master's degree and some college or less combined. But that's not the point. The point is this. As we begin to look at the research itself, there's a line that kind of sticks out very blaringly. Let's read. Among pregnant participants, uh, da, 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 report. This, man, this is only day one. This is, only, this is not This is not long. I don't like uh, – you know, they're important, these day one tests. But you know, often effects can take sometimes months or years to arise. Uh, that's why trials for vaccines are supposed to run three years, obviously – it's not going to make a difference uh, starting this Monday, but we'll see if the FDA approves or not. I don't think the FDA – does the FDA ever like not approved anything recently that's in a medication? Uh, but let's proceed. Among pregnant participants, so da, uh, this dosaging, dosaging, miscarriage, uh, nothing outside the actual you know grouping between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated. But among lactating individuals interrupted breastfeeding after vaccination was reported by 155 or 6,815 individuals after the first dose. Now, I don't know, does that happen among unvaccinated individuals or people that are exposed to COVID? See, now I have to, we have to get it in context. And 130 of the 6,056 individuals at the second dose. Decreased milk supply for less than 24 hours by 339 individuals after the first dose. So it could be from inflammation from the vaccine. It could be just correlation. Uh, it doesn't imply causality, but then this part gets me. And concerns about the infant after vaccination by 208 individuals after the first dose, 3%, and 267 individuals after the second dose, 4.4%. Um, now, that's like, then it ends. It's like, what the heck? What What happened? That's my problem. Outside of the extremely unusual sampling uh, size, and I think the study was probably conducted just very, very well. But it's the questions. It's like, how can you, how can you stop after that? Where's the follow up? What, what the heck? And that's the biggest problem. Is a lot of the, the, the brilliant individuals that are part of this event, uh, the questions, it goes back to how you view something like a mask thing. You know, this, they, this is the mask and this is the mask working too. Yeah, that's like to them, that's, that's an extremely effective part. If the, that's them showing you that the mask work. That's not the question. The MIT said, well, what happens to the rest of the stuff that goes up there? For example, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and everyone else that works with fluid dynamics. They go, where does this go? The medical professionals go, Look, they're not spitting in my face. MIT's going, no, they're spitting on the entire crowd. <laughs> That's the point. It's how you, it's what questions do you ask? Well, I digress. All right, and go. Uh, let's review that, and let's go right into the data as follows. Let us begin. Ba -ba -ba. Again, it comes down to the questions. So let's go to mutations. All right, question. We're going to be looking at not so much the mutations. What we want to look at is really how much impact the vaccines are having, and I love controls. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick the countries which have a human development index of a 0.64 or greater, all right? And we're going to basically, and here you are, and these are the breakdowns. These are, for example, countries which have over 40 per 100 vaccinated. I think uh, 22, you know, 39 or 21 to 39 vaccinated, all the way down to under 10 per uh, 100 vaccinated. 
And I like the 10 per 100 or the 40 per 100 uh, words because that gives you more of a percentage of the population. All right, so here we go. The world, people fully vaccinated per 100 correlating to uh, total cases per million. All right, now again, I'm not going to go into correlation uh, because there's a lot of other confounding factors that could be involved. But yeah, blue is fully vaccinated. Now, keep in mind, this is on a global scale. Now, this is small countries, big countries, and things like that. All because the correlation is, is 0.912184. This means Pearson, Kendall, whatever, you know, Spearmint, you know, Spearman. You know, basically, whatever it comes down to be as far as what we get got to utilize, um, I'm sure we can we can weed that down uh, to a lower correlation. But normally, what you'd expect if the vaccines were working, and I don't want to say if because I'm not going to give I'm not going to censored. You would see a negative sign. A negative sign would be there. What the negative sign would indicate? Negative sign would indicate that the vaccines are reducing the total cases per million. But that wasn't the case, now was it? So let's proceed down. All right, and so all the graphs are here, for example. Uh, people fully vaccinated per 100 correlated to new deaths per smooth per million. So you can say, for example, from a visual aspect, it looks like you know the vaccines may be working to reduce the severity of illness, or everyone that's going to succumb to the illness has already been exposed to it. So you really remember I said the back in like in February when the when the infection rate, the severity, and the hospitalization rates were like plummeting, and there was like hardly any vaccine. That I knew they were going to try to take credit for it by correlating the vaccine benefits with the drop in cases. Well, again, um, then the vaccine, people start getting vaccinated and the cases start going up as of January. Interesting, but a correlation doesn't mean it's causality. It just means it's highly correlated. It's <laughs> right there, down there. All right, what's this right here? These are This is basically people fully vaccinated per 100 of greater than 40. So correlated to total cases per million in countries with a human development index of 0.64. What I did is I chose a population of greater than 5 million and the human development index of 0.64. So basically we have countries which have pretty decent record keeping. So we can basically make sure our data has a little bit more validity or weight or integrity. And so what's this here? All right, this right here is the total cases per million. This is what it's at right now overall. And the United States, for example, is at 100,000. This is about 75,000 overall. So keep follow this bar. Are you ready? Follow the bar. All right, here we go. And this is people fully vaccinated per 100. So here we are. See, it's above the 40 line. So we look at there. So that's we're about at the 50 line. And so, again, human development index, the fairly advanced countries, fully vaccinated, greater than 40. And here's all of our countries. Da, 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 you see right there. And I think the first one is people fully vaccinated. And this is basically the total cases per million. I know the number looks high, doesn't it? It looks like, it looks like the United States is at like 110,000. And at first, I thought the numbers were wrong too. 110,000 people have had COVID uh, out, of, out of a million. He says that's like you know that's like that's like one in ten, and I'm going. It can't be that much. So what I did immediately is I wanted to validate the data. So I went to Our World and Data, beautiful website as well, and there it is. Look, eventually, United States, 113,635 cases per million people. Let that sink in, and then the vaccine comes along. Let that sink in too. All right, you ready? Not knocking it. I'm just saying, you know what? If you're going to make a vaccine push, I would prefer it under circumstances which were um, uh, a little bit more fluid. Let's put it that way. All right, and so here we are, our countries, uh, 40 or more. I'm down the line. Bah, bah, bah. And then, of course, mortality uh, going down. But again, 
whether that's vaccine or not, I don't know, but it looks gives it the appearance, doesn't it? All right, and again, this is just observational data. So what I'm saying, we have a correlation of negative 0.37. So that's between the high countries, not the entire planet like we had before, just this the mostly vaccinated. So maybe it is playing a role, I don't know, but the correlation is not strong enough. All right, from an observational data. People fully vaccinated per 100, uh, 40 or less. So 40 or so 39, so it's 39, I should say 39 people per 100 or less, all right, because it's under 40. There is that line. What's that line represent? That line represents, obviously, total cases per million in the people which have greater than 40 people per 100 vaccinated. So remember that line. Now you see where it plays in context, because everything's important to context. Since we don't really have any news anymore, it's all infotainment, uh, let's, let's, let's bring some news. So here we are. Countries, 39 people per 100 or less vaccinated. Compared to countries where 40 or more are vaccinated per 100. All right. So there we go. Then there's our countries. Argentina, da, 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 all the way to Sri Lanka. And so in a lot of you would think like Russia and South Korea, Japan, you'd think it, they'd be in the 40 above range. Nope. It, like Australia, look at this. Uh, that's like weird to me because like it's like a prison camp over there. Uh, but the, there, the, that's, the, that's the vaccines per 100. So you see what I mean? And, but they have very few cases, but that they're, they're not as high as you would think they are. All right, proceed. All right, and the mortality going down just the same. Do, 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 do. Here's that yellow line again. There's our total cases per million. And these are countries which have less than, tw less than, less than 20, let's say 19 or less people per 100 vaccinated. And I didn't do a correlation there, but still just the same. And there it is. That's the countries again, the yellow square line is representing the countries which have 40 or more people per 100 vaccinated comparing to countries with 19 or less people per 100 vaccinated. And this is just an observation. And there's our countries. You see your little like the like little flat little squares now. Belarus, Bolivia, Bulgaria, Costa Rica, Indonesia, Lebanon, Oman, Paraguay, Philippines, and Tunisia. 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 And uh, but you see right there? And there is their exposure per um, million people. And, you know, for example, you have Costa Rica and Lebanon kind of leading the pack there, unfortunately. Uh, and then you have like the Philippines, the Philippines, again, vaccinated per hundred, you see where it's going now. And then we go towards New Death Smooth. I apologize, if this looks a little glitzy. I was messing around with the lion plot there but it kind of distracts from the actual meaning of the plot, but it looks nice, but it's not the meaning. Uh, people fully vaccinated and new death smooth per million. All right. And then we go down here. You don't even see it yet. This is amazing. Right here it goes. Again, observation. Correlation does not prove causality, all right, or causation. So keep that in mind. And there could be record keeping, confounding, or the country may just not care. All right. So what we're looking at is less than 10, actually nine or less people per 100 being vaccinated, correlating to total cases per million and a human development index of greater than 0.64. This yellow line, once again, represents the countries which have been 40 or more per 100 vaccinated. This graph represents the countries when nine or less people per hundred are vaccinated. Look at that. Look at the case difference. That's the vaccination rate. Look at the case difference. Now, if you were a data scientist or a statistician, biostatistician, whatever, and all you had the information to go off of, remember, if this, you have to look at the scenario, was this graph here. So we're looking at countries which less than Nine or less people per 100 vaccinated. There's your countries. Algeria, Egypt, Guatemala, India, Iran, Iraq, Kyrgyzstan, 
Libya, Nicaragua, Palestine, you get, get the, the point. And you look at their cases per 100. Now let's revisit that once again. These are countries which 10 or less people per 100 are vaccinated. Compare it to countries where 40 or more per 100 are vaccinated. And then we come up with this. I don't want to add publisher bias, but still just the same. Think. All right, so let's go back down. Now we're going to look at a couple different options here. We're going to look at the United States. I hope you're here. Sorry about that. Let's make this a little smaller. It's going to bounce around a little bit. But let's see if we can fit it all in there. All right. You see the graph right here? This is to give you a better comparison. 11 to 20, I could have made that wording better. It's all the same y-axis. So that's cases per million. You see Chechia just be like being hammered there, United States. The vaccination rate, 40 to 100, vaxxed per 100. 21 to 39, vaxxed per 100. 11 to 20, vaxxed per 100. 0 to 10, vaxxed per 100. Yeah. You can get a little angry, and again, these are, these are controls. But all we're looking at is observation. Doesn't mean there's not other confounding factors involved. But data is data. That's the beauty about it. It's just numbers. And the numbers could be wrong. But as far as looking at the face value, you make your own judgment. Proceed forward. Let's bring make things a little bigger again. I'm going to bounce around a second. All right, here we go to variant trends. The United States is almost pure delta. Look at that. Deaths per million in the United States skyrocketed there this month. Positivity rate in the United States skyrocketed. Let me see one thing real fast. If you notice right here, there's a delta variant percentage. It's 98.23 as of August 19th. All right. Positivity rate United States, right there. When you use fully vaccinated the United States, you can see the amount. Now we're going to be heading towards India. And there's our, our graph right there, and I need to fix that. And here we go, India. Delta, primary variant. Deaths per million, India, right there. Compare it to the United States, three, and this is, what do you think, 0.25, positivity rate India, what do you think that is? Uh, it's our zero, that is, a, that's, that's, I don't want to say, that's, that's astounding. Whether the information is accurate, I remember about June, all the headlines were saying, oh, they're burying bodies in the street and everything else like that in India. And like the whole world was coming to an end and we had to ship vaccines to India. Look at that. I mean, that speaks for itself. Whether there's other, something else involved that we're not aware of, compare that to the positivity rate in the United States. Positivity rate India? Yeah. Vax full, amount of India fully vaccinated. So that's why people tell me that the vaccines need to be done to end this. It, The data, it's like they're trying to take credit for seasons. You know, bottom line is they already said a while ago that within three years that the severity of the uh, of SARS EV 2 would be reduced quite significantly on its own. And, um, but again, this is just even beyond my expectations in reference to uh, pandemic collapse. But there's that. And then I want to use Sweden. Sweden's the primary variant is Delta. The reason I'm using Sweden is not because of the vaccination rates. And the vaccination rates are elevated, but you understand the vaccine thing. You know, if you don't get vaccinated, you can't work, you can't eat, you can't buy food, you can't do all this other stuff, you can't go on shopping mall. You're basically ostracized. But 
So vac Sweden's a little bit better on the vaccine scale as far as percentage of people per hundred that are vaccinated. But the reason I'm using Sweden, because remember Sweden a while ago is also chastised. No, uh, no regard for masking, very little social distancing. They did very little in reference to pandemic mitigation. So we're still using Sweden, despite the fact that they're Scandinavian. I still remember that congressional hearing. That's per million? Right there. Positivity rate, a little higher. Vaccination rate, getting close to the United States. and But you see the point. They're through it. I mean, unless something changes dramatically, it's, it's innocuous. It may be endemic. So maybe it may be positive. But wasn't the whole freaking point to flatten the curve? Then it was give us 100 days of wear mask wearing to get through this. They've been wrong on virtually every corner. And then instead of them admitting that they're wrong, what they end up doing is they end up blaming it on the next issue. And it, now it's becoming problematic. All right, 60 minutes, let's get moving a little forward. But you, you understand where I'm going. This is a, uh, as far as the positivity rates between the countries. And you can see certain countries are like super, super positive, but not in a good way. But you get the idea. All right, let's go to VARES. I'm going to run through it real fast. I know it's important. Last time of the week, was it was not up. Uh, here we go. Um, again, these are reports to VARES, not VARES reports. Keep in mind, these are what has been submitted to VARES. Going to the disclaimer again. The disclaimer being, these are only reports to VARES. They are not validated. And again, correlation does not mean causation. So please proceed with caution. Server injuries reported to VARES, 3,379. Average age a little lower. Shingles reactions reported to VARES require verification, 12,542. Average age is right there. Bell's palsy reactions reported to VARES, 5,319. Scrolling down the list. Thrombocytopenia reactions reported to VARES, 2,888. And before I proceed, part of the problem is this. There are so many vaccine reactions. Let's see what I find here. That you go down and let's do like a regular search on the NCBI. You can read all the weird side effects uh, that are associated with the vaccines. It goes on and on and on and on that there's just too many to mention uh, in reference to what, what occurs. A lot of them, I don't even, the reaction I never even heard of, uh, you know, basically in re reference to that. So again, it, you, we can't cover all the reactions. It's just too freaking many different reactions, small levels, large, because again, this is unprecedented, the vaccination, the vaccine push that's going on. So who knows? Uh, but we can't cover all of them. So we have to just cover the major ones. All right, let's go. Paralysis reports to VARES, uh, 4,448. Myocarditis, again, look at the average age. That is really weird. Uh, 4,319 reports to VARES in reference to myocarditis. Thrombosis reactions by age reported to VARES, 6,933. COVID illness breakthrough cases reported to VARES, I guess from, from vaccine or whatever, I don't know, 64,470. Duplicated reports we went through. All right, scroll down real fast. Oh, wow, that's a long line, long line. These are the numerical aspects of the reactions. Uh, these are the vaccines but the reactions associated with each vaccine. So if we compare it to all the other vaccines up to August, from January of this year to August 13th, obviously you see that those don't even scratch the surface there. 460,861 vaccine reports as far as being unique VARES IDs, which associate to reports instead of duplicates. Scrolling down, vaccine reports by reaction by age. Reports to VARES, 6,002 in reference to deaths. Reported to requires verification. This is the ages. Yeah, you are beginning to see 
a uh, little bit in the younger group there pop up. Uh, this is by week, reference to that. Let's scroll down. I'm speeding through. See if there's anything else pertinent in the VARES database. There's our comparison to 2020. 460,861 compared to 57,115 for all of 2020, and it is only August. Scrolling down a little more, make sure I'm not losing any other information. Oh, word charts. As far as that, each group. Oops, here we go. This is, uh, oh, wow, it really jumped in it. This is the common reactions by text size. Uh, from all reactions reported. There is the most often ones you're going to read as far as general with minor. As you see it before us. Pulse absent. These are well, these are above I've jumped ahead. I apologize. Every time I have to try to minimize the screen it jumps ahead. Uh, most common one. Uh, this is the most common word utilized obviously individuals who passed away. Um, one way or the other in correlation that had been reported to VARES, I should say. Associations reported to VARES, not a validated report, or just reported to VARES. All right, as you see, reference to that. A lot of COVID 19 reports, a lot of COVID 19 pneumonia reports. Uh, vaccine reactions by age minors. Now we're going to the minors. Lot numbers with the greatest reactivity, it appears, or most number of reports associated with it. Uh, children. Most common words utilized in the sentiment analysis. Let's put it that way. Chest pain, C-reactive, reactive proteins. Most common reports in children. Chest pain is still number four, and it's catching up quite fast. Um, give you a second look at that. Scroll down, and as I predicted before, as you begin to vaccinate more and more vaccine-hesitant individuals, blue line representing the number of vaccines being administered, red line indicating the number of reports, you see that? Reports are going up. And then, um, wow, that shot up. So we're going down the line, and more information to go through, but we're so short on time, so let me proceed forward. The most common reactions they had 13,602 mortality reports submitted to the Eudora Vigilance uh, vaccine database in Europe these are the most common words associated with those reports this is the most common reactions reported to Endura Vigilance again I'm parsing my words carefully These are the most, these are only the serious reactions. Remember, we can't go through all the reactions because the maximum their CSV files will hold is a hundred thousand rows. Many of the reactions from certain vaccines go to the three hundred to three hundred thousand plus range. So there's more reactions than I could actually download per thing. Because it's some again, it's, there's a lot of them. Uh, these are the most serious of the reports in the value counts, which occur most often. All right, and then we'll go through forward, and then we'll go here, and we're just gonna scroll down right here. This is the average United States, average age of mortality from COVID-19. All right, that's using the CDC's database. Average life of expectancy in the United States is 77.3 as of 2020. It's gone down from 2019. And so these are the individuals above average life expectancy that have uh, succumbed to COVID-19. These are the younger individuals uh, that barely scraping the chart. If you want to know the numeric numbers, let's make this bigger. Make it really big. All right, it's 4K, but you can see these are the number of deaths associated with each age group. All right, you got that part there. Scroll down. Let's see. I'm going to go, I'm going to have to skip for time and go through all this. Da, da, da. Let's go to states. All right, here's our states. What we're looking at here is new deaths per thousand, 100,000. 
and we're comparing each state Florida California New York and Texas you know so you see the trends now the certain aspects that you have to look at this for example the average age of each state uh, diabetes rates and so on and so forth but this is your mortality per hundred thousand per state regardless of the mitigation factors that you're utilizing so I'll leave that up to you to look at we all know looked at the rest of the world as far as how they perceive and reference the vaccines and things along those lines uh, but we're going to probably be using Florida and Texas as our controls, and we'll cover these in the future as well, too. Uh, new deaths per 100,000 average since 20, uh, 20, April 15th. So we're knocking Florida right here, big time, and we're knocking Texas big time. But a lot of the states which have a higher death rate per 100,000 are actually heavily vaccinated and use strong pandemic mitigation factors. So taking into account all states, you're really difficult to say that this is because they have lax rules. You know, Florida and Texas in particular is states with tougher rules, for whatever reason, it could be other confounding, um, or have a higher death per 100,000 than the states in question, were ones being picked on Texas and Florida. And there is the charts, the way it goes. All right, let's wrap it up there and let's see what we covered real fast for reiterate. And we covered the breakthrough infections and people who are fully vaccinated, how long they may be shedding up to 32 days past. Uh, we basically covered the fact that viral loads seem to be the same in the unvaccinated and vaccinated. But again, the BMJ did say, for example, that the reactions are not as serious in the vaccine individuals. We'll see how long that holds. Um, Drug repurposing, this is where reference to the uh, lactoferrin. We cover basically the uh, masks, only being able to block 10% of XL aerosol drops. Uh, we covered the, 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 we did the Mayo Clinic one, yeah, I like that. We did the patients with the history of first dose COVID. We did, I'll have links to all the um, uh, other studies as well. And I'm rushing real fast. Natural antivirals, put immune invigorators, short-term reactions, links, reviews that we did there. And I am going to leave you with my favorite video. And good night all. This is, again, this is a picture of the mass working. We look forward to seeing you all next week. Really enjoyed doing the videos. This one's run over an hour and 12 minutes, prior, our longest one to date. So please forgive me if I just carried on too long, but still just the same. All in our best interest. Catch you all next time. Good night all. Bye. Almost forgot. In gratitude to all the great researchers and researchers out there, I am humbled by your work. But thank you very, very much. And once again, long goodbye. See you all later on. Catch you next time. Bye-bye.